Welcome to United by Trucks. Today, we're back on rust repair on UBTK5. Hi guys, so I know it's been a minute since I posted something on UBTK5 or posted anything at all really. Probably the longest period in the whole year that I've been on YouTube that I haven't posted a video. I've been really antsy, but my travel schedule's been crazy. Mike's been working a lot, but we are finally back over at How's It Doing Garage today, and Mike has got a ton done on UBTK5. So I know you can probably tell over here on the driver's side, not a whole lot done, but the passenger side, been a lot of surgery, a lot of work, a lot of cutting, a lot of grinding, a lot of welding. So he's recorded a couple of videos that show some of the tools that he uses, some tips and tricks that he uses when doing rust repair. So we're gonna drop those in right now and we're gonna catch up with you at the end of the video with a wrap up on where Mike stands today on the rust repair on UBTK5. All right, so what we're doing, uh, we're working on Robbie's rust repair on his K5. And I'd like to take a little minute to uh, go over some of the tools that I like to use when doing my rust repair. So I'm taking mine, I have no formal training for doing rust repair. I just kind of picked up what I picked up over the years and uh, it's kind of a culmination of everything. So anyways, let's start with uh, body hammers. There's different body hammers, like if you're doing like coach building and, and so forth, you know, you'd have a completely different set of sheet metal hammers. This is a body repair set for doing, you know, dent repair and, and whatnot. And these are relatively inexpensive from uh, Eastwood. These three are from Eastwood. This one is actually from AutoZone. Bought it probably 15 years ago. Still holding up. You get a various different amount of hammers, you know, with waffles for shrinking, big, you know, flat edges for hammering out dents you know, and so forth. Like I said, these are Eastwood. You can get them on Eastwood. You can get a decent set of hammers from Amazon. You know, if you're just doing this in your garage, you just want to hobbyist it, you don't need to go spend hundreds of dollars on a set of hammers, you know, because you're just not going to get that value back out of them. The next thing I like to point out, my three inch cutoff tool. Uh, this is actually a really inexpensive one. I think it's cost 30 bucks or something on Amazon. It kind of sucks, to be honest. It doesn't have a lot of power. I make up for it by putting a really skinny cutoff wheel on it. As you can see, I think this cutoff wheel is like 45 thou. Um, you can get them up to like eighth inch. The thicker the cutoff wheel you put on it, the more power it takes to remove the material so that the better it bogs down your tool. So I make up for lack of power with putting a thin cutoff wheel on it. Also, for some reason, I have a uh, flow control on this. I don't know why. Um, anyway, <laughs> the, I put a swivel end in it. Sometimes you get in some tight spots, and it really helps have a swivel end on this particular tool. Next up, we have an air saw. I cannot express this enough. Harbor Freight sells an air saw. Ingersoll Rand also sells a, a air saw similar in shape and design to the Harbor Freight air saw. It is my expert opinion, those are both junk. Uh, if you have one and you love it, um, that's fine, whatever. I wouldn't waste my money on any of them. I would buy the Chicago Pneumatic one. Uh, I think they sell them for a little over $100 on Amazon, or you get them right from the manufacturer, whatever you want. I've had this air saw for, I don't even know, over five years. Um, it works great keep oil in it it'll, it'll probably work forever the blades also again harbor freight sells blades for these i think they're junk um the moment you hit a like a spot weld or anything with the the blades you can see this one turning kind of blue because it's got hot but the cheaper the blade the the the, the quicker it's going to dull like this blade has obviously been overheated but you can still feel the teeth that are plenty sharp um, so you get what you pay for with the blades. Again, you can get them on Amazon. Uh, the Chicago pneumatic blades seem to work really well. Morse cutting products, they make some really good blades also. Um, so I kind of, I, I try to buy quality blades. They seem to last uh, quite a bit longer. Some small, tiny screwdrivers. Um, I kind of use these as like panel alignment tools. You know, you got two panels you're trying to butt weld together. You can kind of uh, stick these in the crack and kind of help align the, the panels and get them you know, flush with each other. If you cannot get these butt weld clamps in there, these butt weld clamps are fairly cheap. Um, some of, I have uh, probably a hundred of them. 
Some of them I got at Harbor Freight. Some of them I got off Amazon. Uh, I think you can get eight of them at Harbor Freight for like $6 or something. These do work really, really well if you're doing butt weld sheet metal. Um, they do not work on curves, obviously, because you're pinching the metal here. So if the metal is contoured at all, it's going to straighten it out and kind of screw up what you're trying to do. But if you have two, you know, flat planes you're trying to pinch together and tack weld, these are invaluable. One problem you will discover is once you tack weld your two panels together, the two panels will actually shrink and draw in. So getting these out is going to be a pain. You can overcome it, but you know, just be aware of that. Next up is probably the most important tool for doing rust repair, a spot weld cutter. They sell a zillion different variations of a spot weld cutter. If you're just going to do a rocker or a set of cab corners on your, you know, granddad's old pickup or whatever, you do not need this expensive of a cutter, but if you plan on doing like, you know, your rockers or buddy rockers and maybe your dad's rockers or whatever, I would get this cutter. The cheaper cutters, I think, you know, like 20 bucks or whatever, they come with a cutting attachment that's reversible and it'll have two cutting sides and you break the one side and you switch it around, put it back on, whatever. They work and they work good. Um, they are very, I seen very brittle. I, I, when I had one, I seemed to break it. I'd probably break one or two cutting attachments per job I would do. This tool was actually gifted to me by a friend. So I don't know exactly how much this particular tool would cost, but Matco, Snap-on, um, Cornwell Tools, Amazon sells a cutter similar in design to this. And I myself would spend the extra money and get this cutter, the cutting attachments, last a ton longer than the cheaper cutters the cheaper cutters i don't ever seem to have any luck with but these cutters and obviously they come with a varying different sizes quarter inch and goes all the way to like three eighths if you look in here you'll see this cutter is actually broken you will see that there's two different cutting edges on here the theory behind it is the outside cutting edge will cut Till it reaches the inside cutting edge and then the cutter will stop cutting and then that's how you know how deep you need to go with your spot weld i myself have never had much luck with it i don't know if i push too hard with the cutter and the drill i always seem to if i'm not paying attention it never seems to stop and just blows a hole right in it so that's something you have to be aware of when you're cutting spot welds if you need to put a panel back on and you want to weld over top of the old spot weld you obviously don't want to cut a big hole in it because then you have to get a backing plate and put behind there and everything else before i ever cut my spot welds what i like to do um, i take a sharpie obviously the paint color of the vehicle would dictate what color sharpie you're going to use if you got a dark color i like to use the gray sharpie light color you know like white or whatever i use the black sharpie i'll go through and try and find all of my spot welds i need to cut out and then mark them with the sharpie I'll come through with an eighth inch drill bit, which is roughly the same size as the pilot on the cutter, and do a little pre-drill, not all the way through the metal. I mean, I guess you can kind of go all the way through if you felt like it, but I usually don't. I find that this little tiny countersink drill bit works really good because then you could sink this drill bit down in it so you, you lessen the risk of actually breaking your drill bit because it is an eighth inch, it is kind of weak. So I sink the drill bit down in this cutter and then I just put this in my drill. Also a little kind of homemade deal. I think they sell a kit of these. They're called uh, pinch weld rippers or something like that. Now once you get all your spot welds cut, say you're doing a rocker, you got all your inside outside pinch welds cut. Then you have the front and the rear of your rocker cut to where you're going to replace it or whatever. And you need to separate that rocker from the body and pull it off. I like to use this tool. This is just an old crappy uh, screwdriver that I probably found in a grout sale or something. Sharpen the edge. So it's kind of got, not like a sharp, sharp edge, but it's kind of got like a knife edge to it. It used to have a point on it, but I broke it. And then I will put this in the pinch weld and kind of tap it with the hammer and kind of separate the pinch with all the seam sealer and everything and kind of break. If there was, you know, you get off angled on a spot weld or something and there's still just a little bit of weld, this will actually help uh, pry it apart or cut it apart or whatever. And they do sell a kit of these. There's like two different tools and then there's a little tiny pry bar and stuff for doing that. Um, you can get that on Amazon or any uh, tool manufacturer. What I found that really helps me for locating spot welds is some, sometimes they're hard to find 
is I will go over wherever you believe there to be spot welds. I'll go over them with a scotch Brite pad and kind of scuff off the paint. And wherever there is a spot weld, generally you will see the circle where the paint doesn't get sanded off because it's, you know, contoured in. If you're doing a panel replacement, you got a new rocker. It's always going to have a uh, E-coat on it. So you don't want to weld to the E-coat. Uh, so what I like to do is I usually use the scotch Brite pads. I use the scotch Brite pads because the scotch Brite pad doesn't remove material. It'll remove paint, but it won't remove actual metal from your panel. If you use something like a sanding grinding pad or whatever, it's going to grind off material. So then your, your butt weld joint, one side's going to end up being thinner or you'll end up making a knife edge to it, which is just going to allow you to blow a big giant hole in it when you go to weld them back together. So I always try and sand off any kind of paint around my weld area with one of these scotch Brite pads before I, you know, put the panel on and everything like that. And then, uh, like I mentioned earlier about seam sealer, I use different types of wire brushes to get my seam sealer out. So this one here, if I got a big area I got seam sealer in, I'll take this dude and put it right in my four and a half inch grinder and it really will remove a ton of seam sealer really quickly. If you're in a hard to reach spot, I have these little tiny uh, wire brushes. Um, this little dude that goes in the uh, quarter inch angle grinder. So I'll use them to get any kind of seam sealer or anything out of the joint. Various backing pads for your quarter inch grinder. I mean, I have a ton. This is just a small collection that I grabbed to demonstrate. There is different attachment types on these. You have type A, uh, type R, type S. I mean, you have a, you know, a bunch of different kinds. Most of the time, I believe I use a type R, if I remember correctly, is what type these are. Doesn't say, magically, go figure. I ordered some of these from McMaster Car. McMaster Car has a ton of backing pads. They have a ton of abrasives. Um, obviously, Amazon has a ton of them. It's just kind of whatever you, you need or use or whatever. And then, you know, they sell three inch. Uh, this is a two inch. Um, this actually used to be a two inch that I ground down to get smaller. Um, you know, they have a ton of different attachments and a ton of different abrasives that go in there. Um, they also have 3M makes a pretty cool attachment that uh, looks like a bunch of little plastic bristles that are really good for removing rust. Uh, I don't have one because I destroyed it. Die grinders, um, 90 inch angle grinders, whatever you want to call them. Again, this is another air tool that you're going to get. Uh, more bang for your buck the more money money you spend on it uh, this is a harbor freight tool uh, this is an ingersoll ranch slightly more expensive still not top of the line i think this die grinder was like 60 bucks or something and this obviously i think is like 10 dollars or whatever you can tell this one's quite a bit more powerful than this one this one has a small attachment on the front of it because that's about all it can power um, it's a fairly weak tool uses a ton of air and that's another thing you got to look for when you're using air tools is your compressor going to support the tool. So, you know, when you buy an air tool, you got to look at how many CFMs it takes versus however many CFMs your air compressor is and kind of match them up a little bit. So this tool uses a ton of air. This tool uses a little bit less air, more power. You know, obviously this tool, since it's a lower model, uses a ton of air and is uh, almost useless to me. But they make... Matco makes a really, really nice die grinder that someday I will own. Also, another tool I love is my Dynabraid file. This here is probably, next to my welders and stuff, it's probably the most expensive tool I own. I think this tool, brand new, is somewhere in the neighborhood of like 600 bucks. So this tool is, uh, I mean, it is expensive. Uh, the average Joe probably isn't going to own one of these, you know, because, you know, $600 can go forwards a lot of tools for other things, but... Um, this is also probably one of my favorite tools. You can tell the small sander can get almost anywhere. I mean, you can, you can really jam this thing down into places and sand off paint, spot welds, all kinds of other stuff. Another big tool I use, my four and a half inch grinder. Uh, this is a Walter grinder. This is quite an expensive grinder. Um, again, you know, if you're just a hobbyist, you don't need an expensive grinder, but this one, you know, I use it for a ton of other things. So, you know, I kind of got to put a little bit more money into it. You know, so it stays around a little bit longer. But a four and a half inch grinder for the home hobbyist is probably plenty. 
I think this one is uh, 10 amps or something or 9 amps or something like that. It's probably plenty of grinder for the home hobbyist. You know. Cordless drill. Obviously, this is your bottom of the barrel drill. It's Ryobi. And the only reason I even own this drill is because I want it. But it's a decent drill and it drills 8 inch holes just fine. So that's what I use to drill all my spot welds and everything like that. Air blower. Blow off any kind of crap that gets in your way around your weld or whatever. Heat gun. This is a Harbor Freight heat gun. I use this to heat up any kind of seam sealer or uh, sound deadening or anything like that. I'll use this heat gun to heat up the seam sealer and then just take a small putty knife to kind of pry it out of the joint or whatever. Because the last thing in the world you want to do is weld the seam sealer. It creates a mess. So a little heat gun, a little controlled heat will get the seam sealer really soft, move it out of the way. It works pretty good. You know, one of the tools I like to use for rest repair. I'm gonna just go over uh, one technique I like to use for rest repair. So this is uh, this is actually one of the panels I started to form for the rust repair on the K5 Blazer. I actually bent this at work. I don't have a sheet metal break at my house currently. I knew the general size, uh, size of the lip, and I pre-bent the lips at work because it's just so much easier. And then I'll come in here and uh, cut my shape out of here, uh, bead roll in the pinch weld offset in here, and then, you know, weld this into the panel. When you have lips like this, generally you have spot welds down it. What I like to do is if I cut a six inch lip off and it's got four spot welds in it, generally I will put four spot welds back into it. So, and then when I cut out a panel, I like to save it. So that way I can use it as a reference. Like if I have this panel off the K5, I'll set it up here and I'll say, okay, it's got four spot welds on this lip. And then I'll kind of measure and see if I can put the spot weld in the same area. You know, sometimes you, when you're making a panel, you can't get a drill in there to put that spot weld in that area or what have you. So sometimes you gotta kind of you know, fudge it over or whatever a little bit. If you're in your garage and you need to make a panel similar to this and you got two lips and you don't, you know, you don't have a way to form a lip as clean and defined as this or whatever. Generally, but you know, what I do, since I don't have a break, is I'll get like this little table here. I have this big chunk of aluminum, measure my lip and put my panel on here and take a piece of like, quarter by two angle iron or what have you on here and grab a bunch of welding clamps and clamp the angle iron down to the very edge of the metal and then hammer your lip down. And I also have a pair of duck build vice grips that I will clamp on and bend the lip down and try and get it uniform. You're not gonna end up, at least I've never had any much luck with it, but end up with quite as uniform a lip as this. I was just straight and flat, very, factory looking edge a couple tips i like to use when i'm making my panel same spot welds you take out put back in if you're going to weld this panel in and you're not going to be able to get to this back side of the panel uh they make a ton of different primers for weld through primers u-pole makes a good weld through primer you want to clean this all up remove this scaly rust and stuff because actually uh, surprising enough paint does not stick to rust so you want to clean that off, prime the whole back side of the panel, weld your panel in, and then if you can, you know, get to this or whatever, uh, I recommend spraying a beeswax. They make all kinds of like beeswax applications where you can stick a tube up behind whatever you're welding and spray a beeswax on it to cover the weld joint up so where stuff doesn't creep in behind your weld joint. If you have a pinhole or something in your weld joint or somewhere you didn't weld it good enough, moisture will get in behind it. And if you have a body filler or anything on the front of it, the moisture will push the body filler off and then you'll end up with a bubble. Moisture will actually start transferring over down the weld joint and pushing all of the body work off the whole weld joint and just generally making a big giant mess and having you to start over. And sometimes it's a quick process and sometimes 
you know, the first time you wash it, it'll get moisture behind it. And then the first time you have a cold day or something like that, and that moisture gets cold, it's really going to push that Bondo out. So you could repair a panel and then six months later, all your Bondo is falling off of it, you know, because you just didn't take the, the proper prep to, to ensure that the panel is repaired nicely. Here is where that panel that I just showed actually goes. Um, as you can tell, with quite a bit of rot in here. And this panel here is just a flat surface. One lip back here coming out, lip on the bottom coming out. So what I'm gonna do is I'll remove the seat belt and then this pinch weld here. I will put that onto the new panel thought there was a lip here that I'd have to bead roll into it, but there's not. It's just on the inside. So basically cut the shape of the uh, pinch weld in here back into this. Get it all mocked out where I need to cut this panel and this panel. Cut it out, but weld it in there. Come up on the side. You can get into the back side of this, so we'll be able to paint. I'll have to figure out what's going on with this seat belt behind here. I'm not a professional rust repair guy by any means. Uh, I did work in a body shop for a number of years, but it was kind of like a mom and pop kind of deal and kind of picked up just some tips from the owner who wasn't the best rust repair guy in the world. He was more of like an old school hack, but he did have some good tips. If you have any tips, uh, tricks or anything, that you want to share with me or whatever feel free to leave a comment feel free to hit me on instagram how's it doing garage thanks for your time what are you doing over there dude getting my hand stuck in this door <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's probably my least favorite part about all of this i really don't like speaker holes in the door so we're gonna have to address that at some point they make way better looking speakers nowadays so if you just stick that six by nine back in there <laughs> Think it'll make it look better. Good old Sony Explode. <laughs> All right guys, so we're here with Mike and he's looking at some of the hard work on the floor of this K5 that he's been, he's been doing. Um, so you've seen a lot of the tools that he uses. You've seen some of his tips and tricks uh, to get this stuff done. But Mike, tell us what you've been up to over the last week or so. Well, we've had quite a bit of rust in uh, the pasture compartment of this K5. Uh, I started on the, the passenger side because it was the the lesser of the two sides, I thought. But I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but we started with, we replaced the back uh, section of the floor. Um, the patch panel we got didn't come over far enough, so I had to make a couple more patch panels to fill in a couple more little spots that we had. I had to make this panel here where the seat belt bolt goes in. Um, I actually ended up having to cut this seam out and remake it because the patch panel profile didn't meet the floor. So I made a piece that matched the floor, brought it over, kind of tapered it into the new patch panel so it kind of flows so you can't really tell that it's not the same. And then the front, I've got this panel fit. I still got a little more trimming to do. And I still got two more patch panels to make here one little one to make right here but this patch panel this is as big as it came so I didn't have any more actual patch so whatever's left over I have to just hand make it real quick have you been surprised about what you found over there um yeah I mean you are from Michigan so you've seen yeah, pretty terrible is, rust yeah I've seen a lot worse than this but there was some kind of weird rubbery dynamite stuff over here it looked like it was some factory whatever but I used a heat gun and kind of heat it up and peel it off. And that, that's when I found these extra couple holes underneath of it. And so just some moisture had trapped under it and yes. started rusting. So that was kind of a little surprise. But I knew that big giant hole was there. Um, anytime you got like one of these old vehicles, usually especially a four-wheel drive, because people get in and out of them with muddy, dirty feet. The carpet gets wet. The moisture usually will sit there. Yeah. And you get rot. Especially down here in the kick panels like that kick panel down there is completely gone so we'll have to make this whole piece over there um, that side over there is going to get an inner rocker outer rocker the same floor patch i don't think that floor is in a lot better shape so we're not going to come over as far but 
it's still going to need the same amount of attention, I think, is this side. But Yeah, so looking at this side, you've already cut away the outer rocker. Yep. And uh, that's the inner. So you can obviously see the big hole in the floor there. But we've got, a, we've got an inner rocker that he's going to make. And then the outer rocker uh, will fit right up in there. Like I said, a couple of little holes here that will need some patching like the other side. But not going to be any trouble for old Mike Howe at How's It Doing Garage. Because he's got it all going here. And one question I had, I wasn't even sure exactly how this patch was uh, was connected. Or, I mean, obviously I can tell it's spot welded. But I didn't know how it was attached or made from the factory. So one cool thing is Mike told me that it was all spot welded across there. So that patch is in there, you know, in a similar fashion as to how it was factory. So that's a, that's a pretty cool thing. And, and really cool of Auto Metal Direct to make that piece. It comes up along that edge of the floor. Anytime I do a, a rust repair where I got to put a whole new panel in something, because most of the time floors are not a structural component really of a, of a car. Like if you took this out, I've got some pictures and, and Robbie can snip them in here, but you will see the whole floor structure underneath here. Where, that's where all these spot welds are. But whenever I take a panel like this off, I will try and put all my spot welds back where they came off. So there's no any kind of weird, you know, structural issue with spot welds not being in the right spot or whatever. And then when you actually cut an old spot weld, a lot of times you will end up cutting a little bit into where the spot weld was. So when you put the spot weld back, you weld that back up so it's still, you know, the same strength. Heck yeah, man. Well, I appreciate it. It is looking awesome. We'll be wrapping up the passenger side soon and on to the driver's side. Yeah. Yeah. 20 minutes. 20 minutes. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to United by Trucks. As you can tell, Mike is making a huge amount of progress on UBTK5. We're really, really pumped about that. We're gonna start working on the drivetrain next. As you've seen, we've got the donor. So we're gonna get ready, start pulling that out of the donor, get it cam swapped, let Alex Walker do his thing on that motor. And we're gonna get start getting the frame prepped to accept that. Obviously, we've gotta run fuel lines and air lines and brake lines and finish the air management system there. We're going to be relying on Mike to help us get that done too. But appreciate you tuning in to this update of UBTK5. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, definitely consider doing that. Smash that thumbs up down below and leave a comment. Let us know what you think of the progress Mike is making on UBTK5's rust repair. We'll catch you next time right here on United by Trucks. Cue the music.